Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tova Friedman and Dr. Maria Zalewska. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Giller, and I have the honor of being the Chief Marketing Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for joining us. In honor of our men and women around the world who help us with our freedom, can you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we go any further today, I'd like to recognize a few people that are here with us in the audience. First, I'd like to introduce Tova's grandson, Aaron, who has helped make her a TikTok star. So welcome, Aaron. Also with us today is the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's brand new president and CEO, David Trulio, who actually starts tomorrow. <laughs> and lastly, I don't know if there are, but if there are, in, in addition to Tova, any Holocaust survivors or family members of survivors or victims, can you please stand so we can recognize you? Thank you so much for being with us today. So I have worked at the Foundation Institute um, for over 20 years, <laughs> and I do not think that any introduction I have done so far is as meaningful as the one I stand before you today with such an important guest of honor. It is our privilege to have survivors and their families on our campus, and to be able to put together an event where we can listen to a survivor has just been my distinct honor. Our exhibition, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, opened just one week ago. No book, no podcast, nor history lesson can prepare you for the power and impact that this collection of artifacts holds. Speaking specifically about this exhibition at the Reagan Library, Auschwitz survivor David Lenga said, for the Holocaust deniers and doubters, this exhibit is a stark reminder that truth cannot be compromised, but must be faced head on and defended in every generation. We've been working on bringing this exhibition here to the Reagan Library since 2017. And now that it is open, I'm speechless, I'm grateful, and I'm humbled. At the cornerstone laying of the future Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, President Reagan said, I believe the Holocaust is comprehensible. Indeed, we must comprehend it. We have no choice. The future of mankind depends upon it. And that really is the root of why the Reagan Library is hosting this exhibit. We need to remember and understand so that we never forget, so that we never repeat this ugly part of our history's past. Today is the first event we are holding as part of this exhibition. Our goal is to bring you one to two events per month while the exhibition is here, to learn about as many survivors and victims as we can, to keep those memories alive. Just next week, we're holding an event about Dutch watchmaker Corey Ten Boom, whose family helped save hundreds of Jews, um, hiding them in their home during the Holocaust. And in June, we're holding a documentary screening on the life of Marion Collage, one of the first transports to Auschwitz, number 432, whose post-liberation drawings of what he endured are a gripping depiction of the pain, death, and horrors of the camp. You can learn about these events and sign up at reaganfoundation.org events. So why are we here today? It's because last November, I had the great fortune of connecting with the amazing staff at Holocaust Museum LA. It was their team that recommended that I connect with Dr. Maria Zalewska, Executive Director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation, about a book she had put together called Honey Cake and Latkes. The book is a beautiful collection of heirloom recipes and stories from Auschwitz-Birkenau survivors. It was these recipes from survivors that gave us the wonderful treats in the back of the room today. When I spoke with Maria about bringing her to the library for an event, she asked, would you like me to bring a survivor with me? 
Well, that was easy. Yes. <laughs> so she connected us with Tova, whose New York Times bestselling memoir, The Daughter of Auschwitz, shares her string of near-death experiences in a Jewish ghetto, a Nazi labor camp, and Auschwitz. One of her recipes is also in that cookbook. Tova is one of the very few Jews to have entered a gas chamber and lived to tell the tale. Tova has been quoted as saying, I am a survivor. That comes with a survivor's obligation to represent one and a half million Jewish children murdered by the Nazis. They cannot speak, so I must speak on their behalf. So let's hear her speak. To discuss her experiences, as well as the importance of the Honey Cake and Latkes book, let's bring up Tova and Maria, and they will be joined about midway through by her grandson, Aaron. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Does, it works. It okay. works. It works. Yes. As long as it works. Um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for coming here today to visit the Auschwitz exhibition not uh, long ago, not far away, uh, and thank you for coming to this conversation uh, with my dear friend Tova. Uh, before we begin, I just want to thank uh, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library for having us uh, today. Uh, huge thanks to David Trillio and uh, Melissa Giller. Um, let's start, so, so just, just so you know, Tova and I have known each other for a couple of years. We're close, uh, good friends, so this is, this is just our regular chat. This is, this is what we do. <laughs> and we just get 400 <laughs> people to listen to us today. Um, I, I, <laughs> go ahead. I just want to say that yeah. uh, before we start, I want to thank my family, you know, very emotional to me. We have very little family, we who are Holocaust survivors, because all our family has been murdered. So we have so little, and here are two members of my family that traveled from San Diego, Mark and Aaron Nimitz. They are the children of my first cousin, who was born in a displaced people's camp and whose mother was also in Auschwitz. And I just want to thank you for making the effort. And Wayne, who traveled 400 miles from, I don't know what town, I don't know anything <laughs> about California, how far that is, but he, he came and he's a very old friend of the family. I just want to thank you, that's all, for being here. So the, the genesis, of the creation of this cookbook goes back to the pre-pandemic pre world, to January 2020, when our foundation, um, chaired by Ronald Slaughter, brought 120 Auschwitz survivors to Auschwitz to commemorate the 75th anniversary of its liberation. While we were working on putting this delegation together, um, two things happened. One is our foundation, I, became much closer with all the survivors. And you know, when you work in the field of Holocaust remembrance, you have conversations with survivors, but a lot of times they're very formulaic, very same questions, very same types of conversations. But when we worked together on putting this delegation together, we, one, became friends, and two, we started trusting each other on a very different level. And I think that when you think about testimonies, when you think about memory, trust is of, of utmost importance. So when we came back, um, our foundation had very ambitious plans. We wanted to organize all of those reunions and person meetings, and then COVID happened. So as a result, we started connecting on Zoom. And actually, paradoxically, I think we spent more time talking to each other because we were all stuck home. And, during one of our Zoom calls, it was Passover 2020, actually exactly three years ago, our chairman, Ronald Lauder, asked survivors, there were maybe 40, 50 survivors on the call, and he sort of asked it's like a very sweet question, what are you cooking for Passover? Can you share some of your gefilte fish recipes? And it was just this very innocent question. And 
after the I said, okay, email me your recipes. You know, we didn't think much of it. And after the call, I received 20 emails with gefilte fish recipes. I said, okay, <laughs> we have something here, something special. Uh, maybe, at first, I was laughing that we will have a gefilte fish recipe cookbook. But then we, we were like, okay, let's do something with it. So started interviewing survivors. And from the very beginning, we realized that it was so much more than just cooking. These were stories of um, of love, of traditions that, that were preserved, um, memories of families and, and places and communities forever lost. So it just very quickly became clear that it was very unique. And also asking questions about food and, and cooking evoked new answers. I learned so much about survivors that I didn't know previously. So this is just to give you a context about how, how this came to be. So I wanted to start, uh, Tova, with a, a sort of broad question about the importance of food and tradition to the process of remembering. Food, yeah. I just want to tell you a little bit about our, um, uh, our experiences at the nine, in, uh, in 2020 in Auschwitz. It was a celebration. It, it was 75th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, but people did not come there to lament or to cry. They, of course, we had our memories, but it was a celebration that we were alive. And when Jews get together, maybe when other people get together too, what do we talk about? Food. So <laughs> it started, oh, we made this and you made this. And for hours, we talked about the fabulous stuff and, and what we eat and, and what happened was those recipes brought up our, our memories of what was and what isn't anymore. My mother, my father, our, our uh, experiences. And by the way, in Auschwitz even, people got together and talked about the recipes. While they were starving and had nothing to eat, they talked about the food that they used to make at home because food meant home. It goes together. Food is family, food is memory, food is love, and this book is love. It's not just a recipe book, it's a recipe book of love. And as soon as I get back, I have to make a filter fish for our Seder. So, <laughs> so, so actually, you know, the, the importance of, of, of cooking and, and traditions to the process of remembering is undeniable, but there is a very special relationship to notions of hunger and food that survivors have, and I think we cannot really, uh, it, it goes hand in hand with the, the idea of trauma and certain memories yes. that come back. I was wondering if you can talk, you, you well, share you know, the story of the, your dreams that you had, for example. I find that very evocative. When some people ask me to talk about Auschwitz, and one of the, th I try to explain, I just want to tell you, whatever words, People say it was a hundred times worse. Words cannot explain this. The mind cannot understand it, but I remember hunger. It was the kind of hunger that you cannot even think about. It's, somebody once asked, tell me, did you ever think about God in Auschwitz? Yeah, God was a piece of bread because it was so. And in Auschwitz as a child, I dreamt about swimming, you, I put this in my book, I dreamt about swimming in eggs, in egg yolk. I still remember, I'm, I, here I'm so hungry that that's all you think about from morning, noon, and night, and I wake up and no eggs, nothing. But what I'm saying is food and emotions are completely combined. And, and this is for all of us, all the Holocaust survivors, so when this book w was a chance to us to sort of catch on and, 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 and um, meet our past together. Mm. And until this day, every day you eat <laughs> eggs. We just had a conversation about it. I do, I must say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I hate to say that, but eggs are my food to go to. When I come home from either work or just a bad experience, I'll make an egg. Just because I had two more in the morning, it'll be the third, it'll be okay. I've lived so long, I will live a little longer, but I'll have an egg. So, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> it's funny, but it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a symbol. It's not the food itself, it's a symbol. Think of yourself when you think of a grandmother that you loved. What do you think of her besides her love? Oh, she made the delicious strudel. That's it. it. I know people think like that. I'm a therapist, and sometimes I spend a whole therapy discussing the food they ate at home. So that's very, very connected. I actually, this is, this is a, a really good transition to talk about your mom, because, as you say, scents, um, sort of tactile experience of cooking that takes you back. Right. And I know that, so for the cookbook you shared, uh, Kasia Vernishka's and <laughs> Simes recipe, however, we had very interesting conversations around your mom making gefilte fish when you moved to the U.S. and what that meant to her and how you it see, evoked memories, right? How she, yeah. My mom was the only survivor of 150 people, brothers, sisters, uh, we, we're talking about first-line relative uh, nieces and nephews, not even cousins. 150 people were slaughtered. And we lived in Brooklyn. I was about 12, 13 years old. And every Friday, my mom had um, a cancer, um, and she had a problem with one of her arms, so she would say, come, help me. Every Friday, every Friday, we went to get this fish, and I made gefilte fish. I don't know if any of you know what it is. It's very Jewish. You've got to develop a taste, but it's, we live on it. We, that's, that's okay. So I, she, I would do the, we had a bowl and, 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 and some kind of a, you know, like a knife, a cutting knife. But what was it with every, and she stood next to me telling me what to do, but the memories came. That was the, it wasn't the making of the fish. It was as I was sitting there. And I kept saying, oh, not again, because, you know, I'm a teenager, right? And, but that's my job at home. And she told me about her mother and her father and her sisters and her brothers that were all murdered. But every Friday, they had that meal, every Friday, and they're gone. And as I was making it, I, we were both, it was like we weren't in Brooklyn anymore. I remember that. We weren't in Brooklyn. We were in Tomaszow Mazowiecki, a little town in Poland that's gone, by the way. Not a single Jew lives there anymore. Five th f from thousands of children, five survived. And from thousands of adults, 200 survived. So you can believe it. But as we were making the fish together, the family was alive. She was telling me stories about the singing and the dancing on the Sabbath and the eating. That's what food does for you. Mm. Food is the sort of the fabric of your memories. Yeah, and I actually, I think, I think our audience would appreciate learning more about your relationship with your mom because, one, you credit your mother's honesty with your survival. I was hoping you could talk about that, what, what that means and how, and two, the roles reversed when you survived and moved to the U.S. and you had to kind of parent your traumatized mother. You know, there was a lot of literature about women during the Holocaust. Women were just the heroes, I must say, because they were the ones with the children. If they were lucky enough to have their children with them, because very often the children were taken away or they were shot. But I was with my mom and she would tell me everything what was going on. When I arrived to Auschwitz, I remember, I said to her, we, we, we just got out of the kettle cars and there were the dogs there and the Germans. And, and I said, what's the smell, Ma, what's the smell? And she said, that's how the burning bodies. She pointed because the crematorium w w was right there. So that she always told me the truth. That's why that's, she, she thought to herself like this. Someday we'll be separated. And she was right, by the way. At five and a half, I was separated from her. Uh, I, have to be fend of my, I have to fend for myself. But I have to be savvy. I can't be protected. I have to know. So she told me everything. So because she spoke to me all the time, I have these great memories. But after the war, after the war, mm -hmm. when she already saved me, and we were in Brooklyn, and I was 12, 13 years old, she fell apart because then she realized that she was all alone besides me and my father, but 
she 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 was she missed her she missed her mom. She saw her mom being shot. She missed her brothers and sisters, and then the roles were reversed. And I she wouldn't learn English. She did, she wasn't interested, and she couldn't go by train because she thought of the kettle cars. So I did all the calling, all the speaking. At 13, I took over, taking care of her in some way, as if repaying her for saving me, for taking care of me. And she died at the age of 45. She couldn't handle yeah. this anymore. So you're right. But we was always some kind of food, the going with her. The, every time we ate, oh, let me tell you something else. I forgot that. Uh, after the war, when we came to, back to Poland, she wanted to show me our old, uh, our old, uh, where we used to live. But it was so painful to me that to make it easier for me, she bought me a jelly donut, mm. just a just simple jelly donut and a glass of milk. And every day after, that was already when we were liberated. And we were sitting there and eating and she was telling me about her family. In Brooklyn, every mm. time after school, here I am very, trying so much to be an American. You know, a kid wants to be an American. I don't want to be in Auschwitz anymore. But, but I came and there was my jelly donut and my glass of milk because that is the way she could show me her love mm -hmm. and whether I wanted to eat it or not. And to this day, to this day, jelly donut is my mom. And she, and she gave it to me. So it's so mm -hmm. interesting, you know? Why this book is such a great book that I love this book, by the way. Some of the stories that you share in, in your biography uh, go a little bit deeper into th actually the pro survival and, and how your day-to-day -day life in Auschwitz. And I know that certain rules around, for example, having your bowl, et cetera, that your mom uh, shared with you helped you uh, well, survive. Yeah. I was wondering if you can give she, us some specific examples. She helped me survive by teaching me rules. The first rule she taught me from the time I was about four, no eye contact with any German person, any, any, any soldier, because, you know, I'm, during this, this, this period of COVID, when we had our we, we only saw each other's eyes. I realized that when I went shopping or something, if I knew the person well and I knew their eyes, I recognized them. When I didn't know them well enough and I didn't know the color of their eyes, I did not recognize them. The eyes are very, very typical of us. We are our eyes. So she said to me, no eye contact. I want you to be invisible. I don't want the German to notice your eyes. So look down. And that's what I learned to do. I also learned to, um, when I see a German coming towards me, never to run. Never to run, because they would shoot you. They'd think, or they would send the dogs, the German shepherds after you if you run. So I would, see, I would stand very still, look down, and give them the right of way. There's certain behavior. And in Auschwitz, she really taught me how to have self-control and not go to the bathroom any time I felt like it. You know, for a five and a half year old, not to go to the bathroom? I mean, it's unheard of. But she said, you're gonna learn how to control yourself, and I did. And then she taught me something else. We were given a, 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 a bowl, a tin bowl, and a cup and a spoon, and she said, you gotta take care of it because it'll be stolen. The people who dish out the food, don't look at you. Nobody looked at anybody. We didn't have any relationships. So if you put your bowl out, you get food. Without a bowl, you don't get food. So I remember hiding it. I learned a lot. So when we were separated, I was pretty savvy by then, by five and a half. I knew the behavior pattern. And your birthday is on September 7th. <laughs> And before we, I, I wanted to spend some time talking about how you now educate about the Holocaust, but one of the, um, I want to, I, yes, but I want to, I want you to tell us a little bit about your birthday in Auschwitz and what oh. the gift your mom gave and you. And then we have my grandson. 100%. My grandson has to be here. Because yes. You'll see why. He's, he's very special. And not because he's my grandson. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very, I'm very objective. <laughs> okay. Um, I got a package 
at Auschwitz. Now imagine, and it, 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 was a, it, was, it was such a precious gift that it was inside a bag, a little baggie with a string around it so I could put it around my neck. That's how important it was. Inside there was a piece of bread and, and on it it said, happy birthday, sixth birthday. I couldn't read, of course, I couldn't read, but somebody read, it was in Polish, somebody read to me. I said, oh, I'm six years old. I didn't even know what a birthday was. I wasn't even sure what six was because I didn't know any numbers, but I knew it was something important because after all, I got this piece of bread, but I didn't eat it because I said to myself, I'll eat this bread when I'm dying. I had this idea that when you are starving, you take a piece of bread in your mouth and you wake up, you're not dead anymore. It was like a life insurance. That was, I was, that was my piece of bread. But I didn't know that bread gets stale. I had no, no experience with food. So I put it in there, I hid it. Nobody should steal it. In the middle of the night, rats the size came all the way and ate up the bread. That was my birthday. I never tasted it. But food, food, food was on my mind 24-7. Um, I, I, I will ask Aaron to join us um, in a moment. Um, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, Aaron, join us. I, it's, my, it's my pleasure to welcome Aaron Goodman, Tova's grandson. <laughs> this is one of my eight fabulous grandchildren. I recommend you to have grandchildren. Don't worry about the children. Forget about it. <laughs> So um, for years now, for, for years now, Tova has been incredibly active, uh, educating about the Holocaust, being incredibly generous with her time, traveling, going to schools, campuses, synagogues. Um, she's, she's one of those, you know, there are two types of survivors I've found, those who want to speak and those who don't, and Tova's- Those who can and those who can't. Very good point, yeah. yes, exactly. And, and Tova has committed her, her life to sharing her story. And now the third generation uh, is is um, doing it doing it with you. So I wanted to speak to both of you, but I'll start with you, Aaron. Um, you run your grandmother's TikTok, also Instagram, but mostly TikTok. Um, you're a senior in high school. Um, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about when and why you you decided to to do this. Yeah, so I started this project when I was 16 years old, so about I've been over a year now. And you know, growing up in this generation, in this day and age, we grow up with social media. It's it's a big part of our lives. And it hurt me to see using social media my entire life so much hate and anti-Semitism and these new technologies um, being used for harmful purposes, mm. harmful ways. So I realized that We've been using social media to, to share cultures, to spread ideas, spread messages. And I wanted to do the same, but in a positive manner. So I, I, I've had TikTok for like three years before I started this project. And I, I posted some clips of you telling your story because you know Holocaust denial, uh, anti-Semitism has been around for years, but as time goes on, we're getting new technologies, it's, it's expanding, it's getting yeah. worse. So I, I wanted to use these mediums, these, these media that we, that we have, to, to help fight it. So, so was, was it hard to convince your grandma or no? <laughs> it wasn't hard because I don't think she knew what TikTok was. <laughs> I, I thought it was a candy company <laughs> because his mom works for TikTok. TikTok, TikTok, uh, TikTok, TikTok. Yeah. So I said, "What does a candy company want with Holocaust?" So, so, oh, so we quickly learned what TikTok was and how how to uh, use social media, and um, I, I'm amazed. I'm shocked. This all started one night after dinner. We were we were having dinner, and I asked her if she can answer a couple questions, maybe one or two minutes. And I remember when I said to you. Uh, I said, can I borrow a couple minutes of your time, uh, answer a couple questions, and don't expect there to be many views. Don't expect many people to listen, because I haven't had much experience 
talking about the Holocaust in public. I've, I've been afraid of anti-Semitism and showing my face on social media. So you being so open about it, maybe you want to do it as well. So we started, you did the film, we did the, the quick video, and it blew up. I was amazed by the amount of people my age, my generation, who are on social media and are, are willing to, to see, the, to, to listen to what you have to say, see the videos, and learn more through the, uh, the medias that we have today, the technology we have. Um, and I'm still, I'm still amazed to this day and still not expecting it. Yeah, it How was, many followers? You know, it was just, in the beginning, he said, oh, don't worry. 10 people make, make say, I said, 10 people, what do they want? What, what, what? <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand that there's an interactive, because I, yeah. I, I'm really not on social media. I'm not even on Facebook. I mean, I'm not, not into this. My generation usually isn't, you know. Lucky we know how to do email, right? So, so um, all of a sudden, there were like a thousands and thousands. And then he said, ah, Safta, that's my Hebrew name from grandma. He said, oh. There are thousands of people. I said, why? they asking questions. I said, really? And then they became 50 million, right? Visitors. Is that what the word is? Yeah. Views. Views. Visitors. Views. Viewers. Viewers. But you don't know the lingo. Yeah. <laughs> Viewers and a half a million followers. Yeah, so we, followers, yeah, I yeah. think. So at the moment, we, have, uh, we just passed 500,000 followers and uh, around 75 million views overall in the past year. And you know what's fabulous? They're asking beautiful, wonderful questions. I am so impressed with our youth. You know, people say the young people, 14, 15, 16, most of them, by the way, are not Jewish. What do they care? They seem to care. They do. They care. If you go to where they are, they won't come where you are. Like they, you won't be able to fill here uh, 500 kids unless under duress from their teachers. <laughs> you know, they're not just going to come because they want to hear me. But if they open up the TikTok, there, they oh my God, and we get 200 questions sometimes a day. It's it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I feel like that uh, social media nowadays is, is kind of seen in a negative way, but though, yeah, there's anti-Semitism, there's hate, we can use it in ways to counter the hate, in, in ways that we've never thought of before. See, that's what I, my, my worry, all of us, anti-Semitism is on the rise. The question is, People ask me, or kids ask me these questions on, on, on TikTok. Can it happen here, like the Holocaust? I said, absolutely not, because in order for this to happen, you need a government, and you need an army, and you need a whole plan of destroying a people. Our government won't do that. We still are a democracy, and I don't believe this is possible. But I'll tell you what is fabulous. I am the last generation, by the way. I'm 84. My next birthday, I'll be 85. So that I'm the last generation of memory, and I was wondering who's going to remember us here. There is a generation, not a, my grand, you know. And, 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 and all those kids who are listening, who are looking at me. Do you know when I showed my number that one day, how many people, how many kids were watching it? When I showed my, my, my tattoo. On the video? Yeah. Um, I think it was three, uh, 10 million? 10 million peop kids. 10 million young kids saw my tattoo. That says something. That says that they're interested. And that's, it just gives me a feeling almost like, like, OK, I'll be OK. It's silly to say that, right? You can't think about your own death. But at 85, you better count your cakes or whatever. You're, you, better, you better count your days, your weeks. But, I, I, but I'm happy to know that it, it'll continue in some way because of people like that, like my grandson and the, all the other child, young people who are watching and all of you. Because once I talk, I give you my story. And now it's yours. Mm. Each, uh, each 
one thing. Uh, each year, there are fewer and fewer survivors, and it's becoming increasingly more important to hear their stories and impart them to the next generations. And that's what I'm trying to do with the TikTok. But um, especially as time goes on, today, today, first of all, today denial exists. There's anti-Semitism. People openly deny that the Holocaust occurred or trivialize it by comparing it to other things. Imagine how much worse it will get if we forget what happened. We forget the details. Imagine how easy it would be to deny it. So it's so important that we read the books, we, we listen to the survivors while we still can to, to pass the messages on and, and work against anti-Semitism, denial, and these other ideologies that are harmful to society. Absolutely. Mm. So, so I want to know, um, you know, it's, I wonder how this project, how working together has changed your relationship. How has it changed your relationship with your grandma? And then Tova, I want to know if working with Aaron has made you see him in a different new light, because it's, you know, it's like learning. <laughs> you know, we all love our grandchildren. That's a given because that's nature. But you're blessed if your grandchildren, and not only you love them because they're your grandchildren, but because they're good human beings. Mm. If you can separate the emotional grandparents and also look at them, and I find that he is an, I have to say all my grandchildren, <laughs> you know. He especially has been working very hard. He is a real, special adult. He's going to be 18 soon and going into a very good school, very good college, and he's going to continue this. And I hope that he will be one of the memories. So we're afraid of being forgotten. That's something that all Holocaust survivors feel, you know, like there is either a movie or I'm not movie, sure a book, mm -hmm. who's going to write our story. History. When we're gone, we'll be gone. But then the people like, like, like Aaron and, and, and the people that he touches, they will be writing our story. That's one of the reasons I'm talking so much. The second is it's a warning. It's a warning to see what can happen if you allow hatred. And just because somebody is different from you, you don't have to like him. I don't care if nobody likes the Jews. I don't really care, but I do care if they want to kill us for that. That's the difference. You can dislike, but you're not allowed to act on it. And this is, I think, the Holocaust survivors in general are here to talk about that, about, about destroying somebody else because of color, sexual orientation, religion, whatever we're different, because basically, my opinion is we are more alike than we're different. Mm. And if we recognize it, maybe we'll have a little bit less hatred towards the other. Aaron, before I wanna I wanna spend some time on questions from the audience, but how is working with your grandma? You can <laughs> it's, she's amazing. It's uh, it's incredible to spend more time with you. I, I love spending time with you. And this project has really brought us a lot closer, both, you know, except for work, but brought us closer personally. Um, I, we, we live in different towns about 45 minutes away. And I've been to your house at some points every weekend, just spending the time there to, to talk to you, learn more about your story, which I will, I, every time I hear you speak, I learn more about your story every time. And I love, being with you, I love, like, we're here in L.A. I, I do so much. I paid him. I paid him. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, yeah. yeah, thank you. That's, 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 I think that's a very good moment to, to ask uh, our audience to, um, if you have any questions, we, we would be more than happy to take some. Yes, go ahead. There is a microphone, actually. Go ahead. How do you respond to someone that says that they do not believe 
the Holocaust exists, that it's, they're in denial. I do know someone that is like that. So I was wondering how you would answer. Is that specifically for social media or more a general question? That's a general question mm. or anybody, anybody have mm -hmm. any ideas on how to respond to something? So actually like I think we can have, uh, so first question is to you. How do you respond to Holocaust deniers and do you respond and somebody says it didn't happen and then maybe actually do you engage with Holocaust deniers online? But let's start with you. I, I just ignore them. I think of them, I always tell myself I'm a therapist so at my first job I had to go to a mental institution and somebody came over to me and told me he was Jesus Christ, you know. So what? I was going to argue and tell him that he isn't. I said, okay, <laughs> that's nice and I walked away. <laughs> That's how I feel about the deniers. And then I say to myself, yeah, I tattooed myself. Yeah. You're right. Ignore them. That's how I do Do you engage with, with trolls, basically, online? So social media is a bit different, and I, of course, have my own opinions, but it's, it's, with social media, people believe they're anonymous, and they feel a sense of security being behind a monitor instead of face-to-face. -face. So you'll experience anti-Semitism and denial a lot more often, a lot more frequently. Sometimes it's trolls, sometimes it's not. If it's someone genuinely being trolling, messing around, no, I wouldn't respond. But if someone who genuinely believes that the Holocaust didn't happen, it's dangerous to, to believe that and to spread that message because it can lead to real-world violence. So I would respond, um, of course, understanding them, not being disrespectful, you have to respect everyone, um, but just showing the, the showing Auschwitz, showing what happened. I mean, we have evidence that it happened. There's, there's no way, none of the evidence that it didn't happen is like real evidence, not viable. You can't use that evidence. So we, we need to show people in a compassionate way the, the truth about the history on social media. I would say, tell him or her to come to see the exhibition. Uh, that's one of the ways. Or if they can, go to Auschwitz and see the, the authentic remains of the camp. That's one way. Uh, but I also, I, you know, I always think that expecting survivors to counter Holocaust deniers is that we shouldn't expect uh, Holocaust survivors to bear their responsibility. It's uh, a lot of emotional labor, and I think it's third generations. It's our responsibility, Holocaust educators, to do it. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. There is a question in the back. Yeah, the, yes, the microphone is coming. Hi, thank you very much. I appreciate being here. A part of your story is surviving the gas chamber. Could you please... Um, Explain how that, how, how you did survive the, the gas chamber. I don't know, Swiss. Um, the story about how uh, you were marched to towards the gas chamber, oh. if you can go a little bit deeper into that. Well, we, uh, I was in a children's camp. They were ch separated. In the beginning, I was with my mother, then I was taken away, and I was in this children's camp. And I had realized that the next barrack was empty of children. I knew where they were going. We all knew. That's the thing about children. Children know much more than parents want to admit. Children feel everything. Any problem that's going on in the house, they know. They may not verbalize it, but I knew. So that day, uh, we were given a very good breakfast. That was the first indication. Because we also knew from other barracks, from people that just watch out. The biggest breakfast with the rest, the end of your days. But I didn't care because again, food. Food was the next thing in my mind, not life or death, food. So we ate and then we got dressed and it was very, very, very cold outside, very cold. I'll make it short. We walk to this curatorium. There's, you go down the steps and it's a gigantic waiting room probably twice or three times the size of this room. It was a, a cement floor, gray walls, and each, there were, there were uh, numbers, uh, you know, uh, with hooks. And they said to us, take off your clothes after the shower. This was the, tech, the typical statement. After the shower, you'll come out and you'll find your clothes again. But I didn't know numbers. So I checked whether my next door friend was, where she was, her clothes, got undressed, and we waited and waited and waited and waited. 
we don't know what happened. They, they told us to get dressed and get back and get, go back. Now, I, this book, I have a co-writer, uh, Malcolm, who is a, a reporter for PBS, a serious uh, researcher. He tried to research what happened that day. Nobody knows. So I never got through the door because I wouldn't be here. To the shower, I was in a waiting room for hours, but we don't know what happened, why they sent us back. Um, any other questions? Yes, there is. There are two questions here. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, thank you. There is a person just behind you, and then we'll, yeah. Okay. What were the circumstances that brought you to New York? So after the war, why did you move to, why New York? Oh, New York was a long five years from then. No, no, we went back to our hometown, Tomaszow Mazowiecki. Everybody went back, by the way. Everybody went back to their hometown, all of Europe. Every survivor was going home. Everybody wanted to see who, who survived the, throughout the whole war. You hope somebody survived. Like my mother, my mother told me in Auschwitz after liberation, oh, you're going to meet this family. You're going to have aunts and uncles and cousins. You have no idea how wonderful it'll be. Nobody was there. So we went there. We waited to see who came back. Then we went to this place, people's camp, where, where we, we were just there for a few more years. Then we went to America, 1950 was five years process from liberation to America. And why New York? Why New York? <laughs> we came to New York and the Red Cross came by the, by the uh, boats, on the boats in New York City. And I remember they said to us, you have, they had a clipboard. Everybody had clipboards. Germans had clipboards. The Americans had clipboards <laughs> because you're on somebody's list. We weren't people, we were lists. And the woman says, oh, you have to go to Boston. And I remember my mother sitting on a, some kind of a, uh, a, a, a bag, you know, a, 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 her bag. And she said in Yiddish to my father, let her try to move me. I am not going anywhere anymore. And that's how we stayed in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Story. There was another question here in the second row. Oh. Hi, Tova. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier, but were there any recipes that were, I know this being Auschwitz was Auschwitz, but were there any recipes that were made in the camps? Mm. I don't know what these people are saying. Um, He's asking if there were any recipes made in the camp if you were cooking. But I think that's <laughs> you want recipes in Auschwitz? <laughs> I'll tell you. You want some recipes? Okay. Take very hard bread and soak it in water and enjoy it. <laughs> Say that because uh, I was fascinated to learn about Canada over uh, that was at some of the camps. I think it was at Auschwitz where they received, uh, where they had like other goods and stuff and I didn't know if people brought food and I just didn't know if anything was ever done with So the, the um, he's asking about part of the camp called Canada where the, all the looted things were yeah. being kept. But whatever was looted well, what didn't about go back it? to the prisoners. No, no, what about Canada? If, he was wondering if, you know, everything that was looted taken from uh, survivors who yeah, were yeah, coming to Auschwitz. He was wondering if the things that were stolen and the food that maybe was in those suitcases was used by uh, oh, prisoners. Oh, very good. It's an excellent question, by the way. Yeah, uh, I heard about it because I didn't know much about Canada. I was a kid, right? But that was stolen. There was a, a, a Sonder Commando. So it was a group of people who would take the clothing and then the bodies and sho shove them into the ovens and, and gas chambers. They were the ones who had the privilege because they work with the dead bodies they, and the live bodies. You first shoved them in and then you took the, death, the dead out and you put them in for the crematorium, for the ashes. They were privileged to take food that they found in the pockets 
of the, of the people who came, but not gold, nothing except food. So, so the soldier commando had extra food because they could eat from what they found. But, it was, but the Germans were watching them. So anything like gold, like silver, like uh, 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 watches, anything of value, they couldn't touch except the food. That's a very good question. Nobody ever asked that. Thank you. And there was, yeah, there was a question here in the second row. I know that um, young children today, when they're of age to learn about the Holocaust, that people like you, uh, Tova, unfortunately will not be here. And I'm wondering what you think about uh, Steven Spielberg's project, Shoah project of, um, with technology interviewing survivors the for the future. Um, the question is specifically about what we actually talked in the car, the, the holograms, the USC Shaw Foundation's project that records survivors, the interactive. Yeah, what about it? What do you think? I, I, I love it. I wish they would invite me, but they haven't. I love it because it, it's real. It's where we're not here. It, it's just amazing. I, I am just amazed at the technology. I've been watching it on television. Fabulous. I hope they would take all of us, but you know, <laughs> it was great. Thank you. There is a question in the back. I am a sixth grade teacher returning from spring break tomorrow. Thank you for being here first. One, if there is one thing I could take to my sixth graders tomorrow, one big idea, what would it be? So actually, this is a question I wanted to ask at the end, so this is perfect. Uh, here is a teacher who teaches sixth graders. She's coming back to the classroom tomorrow after the spring break, and she was wondering if you could share like a life lesson, something, oh. if there was one thing, some wisdom to impart upon the kids, what, it, what Very, would it be? You know, every week I change my, my idea about what should, what's my <laughs> life lesson, who knows? <laughs> the only thing I do know is, Try to leave this world. But I don't know if you can say it to a kid in the sixth grade. They think they're going to live forever. But you know, try to leave this world a little bit better than you found it. That has been one of my thought processes. You found it in such chaos. That's why I'm a therapist. And that's why I talk to people. Number one. Number two, I remember asking my father, after the war, of course, you saw the handwriting on the wall. You knew what Hitler was saying. He was in Poland. You know what was happening in Germany. Why did you just, business as usual, he had a little business. You know what he said to me? We thought somebody else will assassinate the crazy man in Berlin. One of the lessons is there is nobody else. It's you. If, if, if the kids, you know, if, if everybody of, every one of us, every one of us would take the responsibility of looking at evil and feeling personally responsible to do something about it, maybe it would never get to the point where you burn people. When you see people who are burning books, and you don't, you know, in the beginning, all those professors, the German educated intelligentsia burnt all the books. If we didn't stop them then, if we had stopped them, they wouldn't go to the point of burning people. Somebody said, you, when you start burning books, eventually you'll burn people. And that's exactly what happened. You have to stop evil at its root, wherever you see it, and it's you. It's nobody else. Mm. It's you. And that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I, th I think we have time for one, maybe two questions. There, OK, there's one. Thank you so much for being here. It's a privilege. Um, I just would like to know, how long were you in Auschwitz? And what was a typical day like for those that were separated from their parents? 
Did you hear that, Tova? Tova? I hear anything. Did you hear it? <laughs> what? How long were you in Auschwitz for? And can you explain the typical day in Auschwitz? Oh. Well, first of all, I was in Auschwitz about eight months, which is a lot, by the way. You, most people didn't make it. I mean, we were supposed to not, I was not supposed to be here because kids were killed because we'd be witnesses. So they didn't want any witnesses. A typical day is hard to say because if you're so hungry, your whole body thinks differently. Uh, a typical day, well, first of all, you woke up in the morning and you were counted. Now we were tattooed. My number is 27,633. So it took hours in the morning and hours at night, twice a day. I don't know why they were counting. Were they afraid we were running out or somebody came in by accident? <laughs> Can you imagine counting tattooed children and the doors were locked? There was no way to go. But they also want to make sure about the dead because people, kids were dying all the time. So they had to have, they walked around with their clipboards. So it was a lot of that type of stuff. And then the kids were very, um, they were, we didn't make friends there. There were no friendships, but there was a lot of strife. There were things like joking, playing, you want to hear a game. A five-year-old would say to a four-year-old, I saw your mom and your dad, and the kid would say, no, you didn't. You don't even know who I am. You don't even know my name. Oh, yes, I did. I know. Come. Took them to the window and saw them the smoke. That's your mom, your dad. So, you know, there were these kind of vicious things sometimes going on when you're so hungry. Then we went for walks, by the way, every day. We went for a walk for fresh air. What was the fresh air? It was the smell of the crematorium. And there were dead bodies everywhere. But that's we also learned about the Mangala. I don't know if you know about Mangala and the experiments. Kids were t talking to each other. And the rest of the time, we were just lying around waiting for the next piece of bread. We were children. We weren't working or anything. Last question. There's so many, I'll just, I don't know, there's so many hands. Rick. Yes, that's a great question. What's the TikTok username? Uh, it's Tova Friedman or Tova Talk on Instagram. It's Tova TikTok. It's just her name. Tova Friedman. I never saw it, by the way. What? <laughs> <laughs> didn't. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us today. First of all, I want to thank Tova and Aaron. Two more minutes. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Aww. No, 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 you sit. Oh, <laughs> it's I for sit. you. Yeah. Oh, sit down. Come on. Come. I want you to meet the people who travel so far. Here is uh, Mark and Aaron and, and, and Wayne. And these two are my cousins that are be well and, and have children and tell them about it, right? And here is a very, very, very good friend, Wayne. Thank you again very much for being here. You make Thank me feel you. great. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as our special guests leave the building.